attacks on religious Americans mounting in the media. So you can see Christians are being slaughtered all over the place. Here in the USA, verbal attacks Because there does seem to be a rising hostility against Christians across this country because of our biblical views. We're now smearing Americans. There are no great religions. They're all stupid and religious. <laughs> dead body, right, for the lack of a better term, and we're kind of exploring the ideas of why did it die, what happened, what were the things that hurt it, what were the things that changed, changed it so much that it would lose its life. And there's an autopsy report after everything, after you dissect, after you cut, after you take a look at it, you close the game, you have to come up with this final result of what it is. And here's what we have found out through the last three weeks, and it's that the church is not dead. The church is asleep. Because the church cannot die. Jesus overcame death. There's nothing more powerful than the love of Jesus, the sacrifice of God the Father. He sends Jesus. Jesus overcomes death. Therefore, the church cannot die. But it's been asleep for a long time. It became lazy. It decided just to take a back seat on the bus and see what was going to happen. And we have been looking at ways on how to revive it. How to make the church the bride again. How to make the church what it was supposed to be, what it was intended to be. And we went through three weeks of that, starting that uh, with the fact that we confused the message. We made it complicated for people to come. We confused the gospel for compassion and generosity. We started giving people food and, and good deeds instead of giving them the bread of life. So we started feeding the bodies, but we stopped feeding the souls. And now we wonder why we have so many people sitting in, in, in chairs and sitting in benches in churches and with a soul that is not even dead. It's dead. They come every weekend and they sit expecting to have a good set of music, a good mes message, and then just go home and not leave it out. So they have overcommitted to come to church, but not to be the church. And now we have a big issue, because the church, the body of the church is asleep. So how to revive it? We talked about ways to do it. We talked about the things that we did wrong, we divided, we created denominations, we lost focus. Uh, we answered questions no one was asking, we built walls instead of trampolines. We set the bar so high, and we confused perfection for holiness. You see, God doesn't want us to be perfect. He wants us to be holy. And in the churches, we, we told people, hey, if you want to come here, you need to fulfill these requirements. All right? You need to uh, live a lifestyle that is different. You cannot do this. You cannot do this. You cannot do this. You cannot do this. And we told people, you cannot do that and come to church. And what Jesus was saying was, come as you are and be like Jesus. He didn't say, be who you are and come to church. He said, come as you are. He didn't say, be perfect and come to church. He said, just come as you are. In fact, he says, come to me, all of you who are tired and weary, and I will give you rest. But we missed that part. We start putting bars too high for people to jump over, and they're just kind of, I can't do that. It is impossible for me to be perfect. And God knew that. Jesus knew that. You see, when you make something, when you create something, uh, it's almost, uh, it just takes like a thought. If you want to be creative, <clears throat> if you want to be creative, it just starts with a thought. Like, oh, I want to do something like a bottle rack where I can like put stuff, and I'm going to do it out of a pallet. Okay, that took me like 10 seconds, right? So be creative. It doesn't really take that much effort. You know what it takes effort? To perfect it, to make it work to find the pieces that go together, to get the nails and hammer that down, and realizing that, ah, that doesn't work that way. I need to change that and make it this way. So if you go to Genesis 1, verse 1, it takes two verses 
to create the earth, the heavens and the earth. So it starts out like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 1. Verse 2, he says, and it was formless. It didn't have a purpose. It was just kind of hanging out there. And then in verse 3 and to verse 23, he perfected it. You see, it takes two chapters to create something, to make it born, to make it come alive, but it takes 23 to perfect it. It's just like the church. It takes time to perfect it. And I think we have uh, fooled ourselves in the sense that church can be perfect, that we can attain perfection on earth in this life, and that's a lie. It's a misconception. Because the church will not be perfected until we go up to heaven with Christ. So until then, we're going to have to bear with one another. We're going to have to get over certain things. We're going to have to love one another. What do you think one of the commandments that Jesus lives before he uh, goes to heaven is love one another. Bear with one another. Love each other so much that people will be intrigued. We talk about that, right? And because of that intrigue of, of seeing how we're loving one, one another, they will go like, what the heck are you guys doing? Why did you sacrifice a, a Saturday night? Why did you sacrifice a Sunday morning when you can be sleeping, or you can be doing sports, or you can be hanging out with friends, or do a sleepover or anything? Why are you sacrificing that time to go to that place? And then hopefully those questions, that inquiry that they're doing, and the answers that we give them will bring them to surrender, bring them to Christ. So that was week one. And we wanted you guys, all we wanted you guys to remember from week one was love each other deeply. That was week one. That was the whole message. Love each other deeply. That people will entreat and they will inquire and they will surrender. Week two, we talked about how we messed up the game plan. The things that we did wrong as a church is that we became too relevant. We tried to sell happiness and success instead of... Uh, Joy and holiness. See, happiness is temporary. It goes away really quickly. But joy doesn't. And we, we realized in history, people wanted to be successful, so we, talked, we started talking about happiness. No one wanted to hear about the problems. They just wanted to talk about how happy things could be. So we started selling this cheap gospel and saying, hey, come over here. We're going to teach you how to be successful. We're going to give you seven steps to make a lot of money and to be happy. And then we found a lot of people sitting in a church who were happy but not joyful. And every time happiness went away, they fell and they walked away from the church. Because someone lied to them. Someone told them that Christianity was about happiness. But no one told them that Christianity was about holiness. So we have people walking away from the church. They go back home, there's a crash in the market now. Success is not so easy to attain anymore. And they're going back to these churches that are giant, and they're like theaters almost. And they're looking at the pastor driving the Cadillac and, and the j War, whatever. And then they just go like, Whoa, hold on a second. My family is starving at home. And you're, you have like a theater? You have like, what? This doesn't make any sense. So we lie to them again. And people start walking away from the church. And guess what? The church started dying. Started dying. Slowly. Every system of the body started just going away, shutting down, shutting down to a point where the church could not work anymore. And then we decided to pick it up and, and just try to explain what happened. So we went through that. And then after we looked at that, we said, how can we fix it? And we said, we have to avoid hypocrisy. Chris Brown says, you are what you do. So if you're a follower of Christ, then show it. <coughs> You are what you do. If you don't follow Christ, then your life is going to show it. If you have two different types of lifestyle, one here at church and one at, at uh, school or one at home, even you have three, you start wearing these different masks. And it's frustrating because then when you start asking yourself, all right, who am I? You start getting confused as to which one you are. Well, am I the guy from church or the guy from school? No, I'm the guy from, from my family. No, hold up. I'm more like the guy at school. And then we have three masks now that we, you know, we don't know who we are. We lose, we lose who we are. We lose purpose. So we talk about avoiding hypocrisy, keeping respect, and accept persecution. Just to understand that church history is full of innocent blood and cannot be denied. Because what we did is that we started focusing on 
Uh, <clears throat> instead of becoming responsible for what we did, we started pointing out who they were. Because they started saying, well, but look at all these buildings, and look at you guys, like, you're getting all our money, and we're trying to struggle to get money, and you guys are buying all this cool stuff. And we were like, but look at yourself. Look at your heart. Are you jealous? You're jealous. Oh, jealous. Let me tell you what the Bible says about jealousy. Instead of saying, you know what? We screwed up. We saw you the wrong gospel. We told you it was about happiness. It wasn't about happiness. It was about holiness. And the church kept dying and dying. So from week two, we just wanted you to remember that the purpose of the church is not to be who you are. The purpose of the church is to come as you are and be like Jesus. We wanted you to remember that when imperfect people carry a perfect message, they do it imperfectly. We have been looking at this, at this dead body as if it was someone else, and we're coming to realize that it is us. We are the church. We are that body that is laying there. It is us. And we, we have been so rough about judging the things that happen, the things that they get wrong, and that's us. That is us. So when perfect people like you and I carry the message, we do it imperfectly. We make mistakes. That's why we come to church. To, to, to ask Jesus to make us more like him. It's not to be happy to do whatever the heck we want. It's to come to church and say, like, hey, I'm screwed up. How can I live a life that is going to please you? And in the process of doing so, we're going to find joy. And the last thing from week two, week two we wanted you guys to remember is we have to match the message with an invitation. We have to overcommit not to go to church, but to be the church. That's the other thing. We, haven't, we, we became really good at coming to church and coming to services and doing certain things here and there. But every time we left the building, we forgot that we were the church. We forgot to be the church of Christ outside the places that we were going. In week three, we talked about um, his purpose is not to make you happy, but to make you holy. That was pretty simple. We're not going to camp on that. Um, so here's what's going on. We're looking at this body, and the autopsy report is saying, it's not dead, it's asleep. Which, it's kind of sketchy, especially after you did the autopsy, you know, or after someone said, hey, it's dead. So it goes in a car, you know, put it in the back, throw it in a car, and then it goes to the morgue. Morgue, how do you call it? Morgue. 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 <laughs> it says, it's a morgue in Spanish, but it does not. Um, and then it goes in, it goes to the doctor. So by this time, it's, it's dead, you know, it's gone. There's a cool video that I want you guys to watch. Um, it talks about Matthew 16, and it's about how um, we, we put our hearts in, in a treasure that wasn't, finding, wasn't founded on Christ. We put our hearts in different things that were not things of all. It was in things about heaven, about Christ, about God. We decided to go for things that were temporary. And we went into this long, kind of like travel uh, adventure to find that treasure, and we got there. And when we opened it, we didn't like what we saw. And we realized that everything that we worked for, it was empty. Something needed to happen. Something needed to change in order for the church to be a church, to come back alive, to be a change. We couldn't keep living the way that we were living before. We needed to be a sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus. And then at a point where we come in life and we say, hey, I went for this treasure, didn't get it, what do I do now? So watch this video and we'll continue with the message. tested by the fire of your own passions. You will be tempted beyond the limits of your own endurance. You will be betrayed 
by the deception of your own heart. Your gold and silver will corrode. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But there is another kind of treasure, one not of this earth. And if you wish to find it, you must first journey from the grave to grace. Your old self must die so that you might be raised from the dead. Lose yourself for my sake, and you will have treasures in heaven. follow me. <laughs> but it's, it's this concept of something or someone needs to die for something to come alive, you know. You, you can't be alive and then, you know, be alive again. No, you die, something has to go away before it comes out. There's, a, there's two stories in the New Testament um, one is the one is uh, Jairus' daughter, and he's the leader of a synagogue, and he comes. It's in Luke, I think it's Luke four, maybe? and he comes in, and he goes to Jesus and goes, like, "Jesus, my daughter is sick. Master, will you please come and um, and just heal her?" And Jesus goes, "Sure, we'll go." So he's on his way, and then there's people pressing in to where he's at, and the disciples are trying to like cover him in the midst of it. Uh, he gets touched by a woman dude, who has uh, uh, illness, so she's been bleeding for years, and uh, she touches Jesus, and she gets healed, and Jesus goes, who touched me, and you guys know the story, and then finally she goes, like, it was me, and he makes a miracle, and as soon as he makes the miracle, then someone comes running from Jairus' house and tells Jairus, hey, your daughter is dead. Don't glory Jesus anymore. And then Jesus goes like, no, we're still going. Because she's not dead. She is asleep. You see, he, we miss this. To us, we fear death. We do. We're scared of it. So death is a concept to us. It was a word that was given a definition so that we could understand when your life ends and you move on to the next one. Death is just a concept. To us, it's a big deal. To Jesus, he's like, no, she's not dead. She's asleep. 
You see, death doesn't have a hold on Jesus. So when people lost hope, they're like, no, she's dead now, she's going to leave No, she's asleep. It's, it's just fine. Let's go there. I'll do it. He goes there. He tells her, hey, rise up. And she rises up, and then she's alive. There's another story. It's in John chapter 11, and it's a story of Lazarus. And you guys have heard the story probably. Uh, there's some cool things in the story, but the most important thing is that... Um, Here's Mary and Martha, and there's a person that Jesus loves, and his name is Lazarus, and he gets sick. And so they tell Jesus, hey, uh, the one you love is sick. They go, Lazarus is sick. And he goes like, well, you know what? That sickness is not going to lead into that. It's going to be just fine. So he goes away, and then Lazarus dies. So Jesus is somewhere else, and word gets to Jesus that Lazarus is dead. And Jesus goes, the disciples are asking him, uh, he says, hey, we have to go back to Judea. And they're like, hey, they tried to stone you there. Um, and then on verse 11, so chapter 11, verse 11, he says, um, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples reply, Lord, if he sleeps, then he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And they were like, oh, I want to get it. Yeah, let's go there because he's dead. So for Jesus, like, death is not, this is how I hold on me. It doesn't bother me. The church is not dead. The church is asleep. He's looking at it, and he's just asking one thing. is, Do you want to come back alive? Do you want to do this? He's asking you guys. You guys are the church. And there are parts of the body that are dead. And he's asking you, he's saying, do you want this church to come alive? Do you want this? So he asked the same question to, to Mary and Martha. We're now on, chap on chapter 11, verse uh, 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with uh, it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So he took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he has said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the great clothes and let him go. He's asking us a question today. He's saying, hey, remove the stone. And we go, boy, stinks in there. And you might not want to do that. And that's us, guys. What is the stone in your life that is preventing Jesus doing a miracle? Not that he's going to stop Jesus, because nothing, nothing can stop him. But he's asking you, hey, you have to acknowledge that there's a stone in between. If you want to see a miracle, we have to remove the stone. So what is that stone? What is the hole that we have in the church? That is preventing, preventing it from coming up and be alive again. The last part is really important. Is that, uh, Lazarus was uh, resurrected. He was in, not resuscitated. He was in resurrected. And the difference, difference between of that is that, um, as you see in verse uh, 44, the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. So when he was uh, resuscitated, he came out tied up with, um, with uh, what is it called? Yeah, like grave clothes is how they call it. Uh, so he was tied up and stuff. He came out with the clothes that he had on, and that's because he was going to need it again. So he came out. He was resuscitated, but he was going to die at one point, so he came out with clothes and he was going to need it again. Unlike Jesus. When Jesus was resurrected, he left the clothes in the tomb because he wasn't going to need it again. He like left it there. He's like, I'm going to heaven. 
I'm not bound by death. I overcame death. Nothing can stop me. So you can keep your clothes there because I'm going somewhere else. Here's the thing. We are the church. He lives in us. He left the clothes back in the tomb to remember to us, to remind us that He is alive. And as long as Jesus is alive, sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, the church cannot die. But are we going to remove the stone so that He can perform a miracle and the church can come back from their sleep? It's us, guys. We are the church. We are imperfect. Not, do not try to be perfect. Try to be holy. Keep it up. This is just a reminder to you guys. God is in the move. He wants to do something. And we might be the part of the body that is going to poke everything else into coming back from the sleep that they are. They're in a coma. And it's about to wake up. And that's our calling. To do it. Do not get tired of doing what is right. It's going to cost. Life is difficult, right? It's called pain. But all this trouble. It's a series of problems that need to be solved. So whether we sit here and go like the disciples, oh, he's asleep. Uh, he just needs to sleep it off, right? If we look at the church and go like, oh, we're just waiting until God does something, it's never going to happen. We have to acknowledge that there's a problem, and we have to tell God, hey, we know what the problem is. We know what the stone is. We're going to remove it. We you perform a miracle. And the one that made it, the one that perfected it, and it took time to do it, is the one that gave it purpose. Because through the 23 verses on Genesis uh, 1, he doesn't bless anything of what he did until he made men. When he made men, he blessed them. And he gave them a purpose. He said, multiply and be fruitful. He didn't bless creation. He blessed us. And we are the church. Because he knows that he loves us. And he wants us back. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this message. We just want to uh, be humble, Lord, and come before you and say we're imperfect. Um, we have been looking at someone else's body without realizing that it was our own, without realizing that it's our systems that are not working, that it's our muscles that haven't been moving, that it's our tendons um, that have grown to hinder us from certain things because we would be laying down with the corpses, Lord. And now all we're asking from you is, would you please... Bring this body alive. Will you please wake us up from this sleep. Will you please, Lord, teach us a way to do it. And through love, through uh, humility, through perseverance, through discipline, Lord, help us to grow together as a church. Help us to be the part of the body that pokes around, that uh, creates uh, electricity, that, that pumps out blood into his body so he can come back up to life, Lord. We know that death doesn't have a hold of you, on you. Therefore, we ask you, Lord, to help us to be the church. Not to go to church, but to be the church. 